In this episode of the podcast, I sit down with Brian Matias. We're going to be talking about why he decided to standardize on Lightroom. This is Twitter. Hey, folks, welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Joining me today is somebody who you probably already know. His name is Brian Matias. He's been a fixture around the world in the industry of photography since, since I don't know, since before I was born. No, I'm kidding. Since as long as way I can remember. Back. Way back in the Cretaceous period. But uh, Brian and I go way back, and we've, uh, like, even before we started recording this episode, we were just catching up on just the state of things. But one of the things that I wanted to record and have a conversation about, the differences between classic and uh, Lightroom Mobile at the time, now just Lightroom, and the confusion around the nomenclature, and who's this for, and is classic going away? Should I use the new version? And if I do, what am I giving up? Should I stick with the old version? If I do, what am I giving up? So all of these questions, I'm sure, plague a lot of photographers, which leads to analysis paralysis, and you just stay in put where you are. Brian nope. made the decision to, okay, I'm all in. As the title says, I'm all in on Lightroom. I wanted to have him on the show to find out why and hopefully explain the rationale around why he made that decision, where you think things may go based on Adobe's moves historically and what they're doing now. And how do you skate to where the puck is going to be, as it were? Welcome to the show, man. It's good. After that long intro, welcome to the show. How's it going? I, I as always, Frederick, it's a pleasure. I've always appreciated it when you've asked me on. And this is just one of those topics that I think is getting a lot more traction, especially with Adobe's update to Lightroom in October of this year of 2023 at Adobe Max. So yeah, I think it's a it's an important conversation to have. I think there's a lot of misconception, a lot of misinformation. So it's always good to just kind of take a step back and let's let's talk what is and what is not. Yeah, and state of the art, right? Because when Lightroom Mobile at the time, which is now just Lightroom, when it first came out, that was a whole different world, right? The the software that's available, the competitive landscape was different. In a lot of ways, photographers' needs were different. Cameras were different. And as you're going to reveal in this discussion, with these most recent updates, it's been a seismic shift that obviated a lot of photographers' complaints about not using that version of Lightroom. So let's rewind and start there. Paint the paint for the folks that may not even be on Lightroom. Right? Mm -hmm. Let's just paint the picture of what Lightroom is. So Lightroom Classic and Lightroom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Still unfortunate naming. Lightroom Classic and Lightroom and who those applications were for cuz the argument will be I got Photoshop and Bridge. Why do I need those jokers when I can just use the real deal? Absolutely. What do you say? I think you you set it up really nicely. So I actually brought up the Wikipedia article for Lightroom because I was like, when did Lightroom, which was like what we call now Lightroom Classic, but was originally mm -hmm. Lightroom, when did Lightroom OG first come out? And so January 29th, 2007, 2007, wow. Adobe announced Lightroom would ship on February 19th, 2007. For the first version of Lightroom was in early 2007. We are in 2023 now. Lightroom, the new version of Lightroom, or what was called Lightroom, I think CC, that was 10 years later in 2017. So think about it. Um, well, to answer your question though, Lightroom is a, Lightroom Classic and Lightroom are primarily photo management or what some people call DAMs or digital asset managers, where a photographer could import their photos that they take with their camera or their phone, they can manage them, synchronize them, they can edit them, uh, and then they can share them using various uh, methods. And there is a very fundamental difference, a line in the sand between what is now called Lightroom Classic or the original Lightroom and the current new version of Lightroom. And that is how you manage. So Lightroom, a classic, is built off of a a catalog infrastructure. So it's a database that's stored on your computer. It's stored on a drive, whether it's internal or external. And it manages all of the photos that you import into it, not just the photos, but the edits that you make. And it's just as, as photographers grow their inventory of photos that they import, that database becomes larger and more unwieldy. And like anyone who understands databases, the more records you shove into it, the slower it gets. And so 
in 2017, Adobe releases Lightroom CC and its primary uh, infrastructure is cloud-based. So no more catalogs. You just load the app, you import your photos and depending on the, and this is the biggest contention, depending on the, the amount of cloud storage you pay for as part of your creative cloud subscription, it will sync your original raw files to the cloud. Those are backed up and those are made available on all of your devices. And so it really boils down, Frederick, in, in my opinion, to, um, you said to yourself, where the puck is going. And there are a lot of users far, I would argue there are far more users who would be turned off or do become turned off as soon as their eyes glaze over when they are like, cat, what's a catalog? What is this catalog thing? I don't even want to know about it. Right. I just want to put my photos into this application. I want to be able to edit them and I want to share them either with my family and friends or on social media. I don't want to think about this thing. Oh, I also want to be able to do that on any device that I have. And yeah. so that was up until Adobe Max, I would say the line in the sand. Lightroom Classic users are like, no way am I going yeah. to, uh, yeah, sync my phone, oh, yeah, pay for that storage. And Lightroom users were like, okay, this is cool. I'll be able to do that. Um, and so that's really, Frederick, I might be oversimplifying, but that's ultimately the main difference between them. Yeah. Yeah. There was like, I remember when it came out, when Lightroom Mobile came out and there was that the excitement, the shiny new thing, excitement, like, okay, let's go get it and try it. And then the, a lot, the, mostly the, from a chorus of professional, the, and I use the word professional strictly, right? So Correct. profession, professionals in that you write photographer as your occupation on your tax returns. That's a pro not related to your level of skill, right? Cause we know a lot of quote amateurs that do other things to make money, but then are amazing photographers, which I would argue is most of the people that I know. Agreed. And yeah. And I remember part of the complaints from the pros was and a lot of the amateurs, to be honest with you, but from the pros was the uh, two things. It was the fact that you were forced to put all your images in the cloud was like Adobe's forcing us into the cloud and I don't want to be in the cloud and limited format support and all the things which pointed that application squarely in the direction of being for amateurs or people mm -hmm. that aren't making a living with their photography, like things like being able to uh, control color, right? To the degree that you need as a pro, like for example, you're doing a shoot for Tiffany's, you got to match that Tiffany's blue exactly. Can you do it in mobile or do you need classic or do you need to just go into Photoshop or capture one to be able to do something like that? So it was that piece, it was the local life. So the cloud being forced to put everything in the cloud and not being able to address your gazillions of images that you have on your local drives. And then um, what was it, the third piece of it? Oh, the, the plugin architecture, the non-existent mm -hmm. plugin architecture being just add a, an extension or whatever into the app to interface with third party or external tools, whether it be to upload or to do additional retouching or things like that all missing from Lightroom Mobile at the time. What has changed in that picture that you think that would convince someone back then that poo-pooed Lightroom Mobile to give it another shot? I mean, that's, that is the question. That is the question, Frederick. If you were to go and find, there's a video that Julianne Cost, who is one of the principal evangelists at Adobe. If you're even fam remotely familiar with Lightroom, you're, you probably know of her and Terry White. So she put out a video. What's the difference? This is, so this was when Lightroom CC version one in 2017. What's the difference? There's a slide towards the end where it shows, it was a laundry list of the things that were not currently available in Lightroom. And it, it was important, a lot of important things. Now though, um, as far as editing goes, you pretty much have everything you could, you would need. The Lightroom classic has that calibration panel at the very bottom. That's not in, um, in the Lightroom, what I call, so I'm going to just call classic Lightroom, classic, classic, and the Lightroom is the new Lightroom just for ease of clarity. Also. So yes, back then my argument for using Lightroom would be, I would be operating at a handicap as opposed to today, because it was hobbled. It was a V1 thing. But 
now you have pretty much there's almost full parity. I would argue that there is full parity for the editing tools that virtually every photographer needs. If someone were to start screaming, oh, it doesn't have IPTC metadata support. You're correct. You're also in the vast minority. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not, but this is a conversation I've had numerous times and I don't mean to come across as a haughty or anything about it. I'm just telling you that like. Adobe is not a dumb company. Adobe has a multi hundred billion dollar market cap. And like for my assumption, you said this before, I have no insight whatsoever, but I've worked at photography software companies and I understand the importance of, um, scaling to a broad audience. Like in a lot of cases, like they say the riches is in the niches. No, like as far as like a photo software, you want to be able to appeal to a broad set of people. So to go back to your question, from an editing perspective, I don't see much of a obstacle there. And well, let me kind of preface it. This, I make my living with photography, like editing photos, teaching people photos. Why would I, and I'm a Lightroom user. I have all of my photos synced in Lightroom. It's what I don't, I haven't launched classic in a long time. Why would I intentionally kneecap myself? That's the question. Like, you, you, like, why would I do that? Why would I put myself at a disadvantage? Yeah. There are people who will say, oh, it doesn't have um, the book module or it doesn't have it print, which I would argue to some degree. Okay. Yes. It, there is no printing, but even then the, as far as the organization and the editing capability, it has what you need. Um, and I could, we can also go into some of the things that I think it doesn't have. And I hope we do get that yeah. are legitimate. Yeah. But yeah, like I, no, Frederick, I don't, I'm, I don't buy the art the argument that you are going to be at a disadvantage to get your photos looking any better or worse, whether you used classic or Lightroom. Yeah. And that's the question. Like, am I by me? Cause that's a big decision, right? For photographers to invest the time to spin up another tool only to be greeted with Oh, I used to do this thing on that tool and now I can't, I have to do a workaround or it takes more time to do that, which I don't have bringing my bottom line down. But you hit something that was, I think bears repeating. And that's the fact that the market for advanced amateur consumer software is vastly larger than the market for pros. Like if you look at it, if you look at it in a pyramid stamp or using a pyramid as an illustration, the very top of the pyramid or Christmas tree, it's the holiday season. So the, right. if the whole market's a Christmas tree, the star at the top of the tree or whatever ornament you put at the top of the tree is the pro market. The rest of the tree is consumers and all the different stuff on the tree and the ornaments and the garland and all, and the gifts, all that is the consumer market. The top of the tree, however, gets a lot of notice because it's at the top of the tree and it's loud. It makes a lot of noise and, you know, all that. That's the pros. So Adobe is committed to those, I'm sure, to making sure that they service those. But from, like, if I put on my marketer hat, from a business standpoint, it just makes good sense to focus on the larger part of the market and put your money there to keep the engines going, to keep the shareholders happy, and to keep doing, to funding the tools that those pros need. Right. So I get, yeah, I get that point, you know, of them going down there. But uh, what I'm wondering is it feels like the, I, my brain is in analogy mode for some reason today. I feel like the, if Adobe was Luke Skywalker flying an X-Wing in the Death Star Trench, the, all the obstacles in there is they're threading the needle, right? Between the pros and the amateurs. And they got to make sure both sides are happy, i.e. don't crash into any walls while you're trying to put the, the yeah, bomb I mean, in the hole up there. How do you do that? Do you, somebody's not going to be happy. You can't please all the people all the time, right? So do you, okay, I'm just going to lean into consumer and make sure that this is the best high-end pro consumer app that can be, or am I going to continue to serve the niche, unfortunately, that is pros and give them what they need to create imagery amongst this whole set of all the other things that are happening in the world of digital imaging, including generative AI and all these other things that everybody's clamoring for, how do, where do you place your bets in that world? Or can you make everybody happy? Huh? What do you think? No. You, yeah. 
I don't know that you can make everybody happy. You can do the best you can. And I believe Adobe's trying and making a valiant effort at that. It, just by ensuring that there's still a lot of feature parity, it's not like Lightroom gets these new features and Lightroom Classic doesn't um, or, or vice versa. For the time yeah. being, I think you no know, Adobe is just going to have to figure out what their strategy is. I will say though, and this is this, so this was a, I was on our buddy, Matt Kloskowski has a podcast as well. And he asked me what my prediction is, like how long before I believe, first, we both agree that Lightroom Classic is going to be going the way of the Dodo. Um, it's just okay. inevitable. And I'll explain my re rationale for that. But he asked, do you think it'll be within two to three years? And I said, no. And then he said, what about five years? And I said, yes, five years. I believe Lightroom Classic will not be, not go away. It's not like you're going to wake up and it's going to be gone. It's going to go into a maintenance mode, similar to, people don't remember this, but when Adobe announced Lightroom in 2017, at the bottom of the blog post, they basically state Lightroom 6, which was the last standalone version of Lightroom that you can buy by itself. That was going, that was done. So I believe that at some point in the future, there will be a major update to Lightroom. And at the end of the blog post, there will be like, okay, Lightroom Classic, it'll still work. You'll still be able to use it. And I, I assume there will be some amount of software development upkeep, just like as operating systems get updated, they make sure that it can still load those kinds of things. But yeah. think about this. And this, is, this only comes from working in at a company like a software company. So imagine, can you imagine this? Like you have two applications. You've got Lightroom Classic on the left and you have Lightroom on the right. For all intents and purposes, they do exactly the same. Their primary function is the same. Yet you still have to employ software developers for each of them, product marketers, product managers, QA engineers, customer support people. For each of them, they're focused on their own things. That is just not good business sense. It, it spreads your efforts thinner. And as we brought up at the beginning of this, it makes the branding and the brand recognition very complex. I do believe that I do. I believe within five years, because all you need to do is think about what five years ago was like from today and how much has changed. People think five years, like we, we think sometimes with blinders on, but five years is a long time. I mean, Lightroom, Classic was 2007. That's yeah. nuts. Yeah. Five so, years. Yeah. Five years is forever. Yeah. yeah. In five years, pandemics can come and go. Presidents come and go. <laughs> All kinds of things happen. We've had a, any number of catastrophes around here that have happened within five years that have fundamentally mm -hmm. changed how we think. Not even just technology, right? In the last year, year, two years, this chat AI. GPT and this AI stuff has basically flipped everything on its head. So what's going to yes. happen in the next couple of years? And yeah, it's, yeah, it's crazy. That's the, you, AI is the thing. So you see a, Adobe putting a lot more emphasis of AI into Lightroom and not classic. Yeah. And so I, that's another thing. And then we can talk about the, what I consider the, that kind of fundamental shift. That was the major nail in the coffin for classic. It, like if you want to talk about, which was released in October in Adobe max, which was a local browse. So that's so, what I want to talk about. Yeah. Cause that, that was the, you call it the nail in the coffin. I call it, I don't know. It's dead. It's, yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, yeah, it's got dead or I feel like it, I don't, I don't know. I don't have any, uh, I haven't been briefed by Adobe, but I feel like just from my, my standpoint in the industry that, like you said, the dual efforts, you're saying like, can you afford to support two or have two, two teams supporting two applications? I think if it's simpler than that, can you afford twice the workload on the people that are trying to innovate and develop the software versus pulling this one along? You probably should have terminated a while back. And I, when I look at it, I think when I look at Lightroom Classic and when they rolled out Lightroom Mobile, my thinking back then was why not, why not put all your effort into the new and make the new the thing, right? And basically end of life Lightroom Classic completely and in earnest 
and move forward with the with the new Lightroom. Therefore, they're thereby moving the whole what's the naming thing going on with classic versus the new Coke and. It's just Lightroom, you know, and Lightroom has evolved and now it does all this cool stuff and it's for pros or maybe do something clever so that whatever the pros needed that you don't want to ship with it, maybe there's some sort of add-on architecture that you can, I don't know, something clever, but keep it focused. Because right now we're still confused. Years later, we're still confused about which is which, right? Right. I don't know. There's, an, there's, a, there's a very easy answer to why. Yeah. And all you have to do is go back to when Adobe first announced Creative Cloud and their subscription model. So Adobe mm -hmm. comes out and they're like, we're doing the subscription thing. There was one contingent of user, one, one vertical that went so ballistic that they actually acquiesced and they created what we now know as the photography plan. And that are photographers. I, why don't let people just move to like, because photographers are like I said at the beginning, very emotional. We invest and rightfully we inv our photography is very important to us. Just I would argue any creator's art sure. and work is, but there's something about photography that's very emotional. It's not like you saw the book designers who use InDesign freak out when they announced it, or even the video people who use Premiere. It was just the photographers and Adobe relented. And it was, a, there were a, comp a couple of simultaneous factors in terms of a lot of negative press from other people in our space yeah. that they're like, okay, we will make a separate plan that just includes Lightroom and Photoshop. And that still exists to this day. Um, the other thing is Adobe is a business and mm -hmm. it's wonderful that people subscribe and pay for their subscription. And that's a whole set, you know, subscriptions are re a reality uh, for better or worse. Yeah. But Lightroom is the only app that I know of that offers Adobe the possibility of incremental increasing revenue beyond just a subscription because Lightroom rely, uh, Lightroom can tie into your creative class storage. And so you can, depending on your plan, you might have 20 gigabytes, hundred gigabytes or a terabyte. But if you're someone like me who wants to store everything, then you need more storage and that storage comes right. at a cost. So it does give Adobe, I don't know how, what, how many people are doing that, but it does give them that opportunity to earn some more revenue. And again, it's a business. And I, someone who's worked at business, who runs my own business, I can appreciate that to a degree. Yeah. And it, it is money. At the end of the day, it is money. And even though I painted the picture of the pro market being small compared to the consumer market, it's small, but it still represents a sizable chunk of money that a company mm -hmm. like Adobe cannot ignore. So you have to pay attention to those folks. I'm curious, your, you mentioned, we were talking about tongue in cheek, the last nail in the coffin on classic was local storage. Explain that. A little further. What is this? Sure. What's this local storage thing and why should I care? I mean, it's, I'd say it's the probably next to the actual announcement of Lightroom. I would say local is the most significant update to that. We said earlier how the primary difference between Lightroom classic and Lightroom is how photos are stored. So you, classic is local catalog and Lightroom was cloud. Now it's as if Adobe took bridge, which was in for the file browser app that they have and they slapped it into Lightroom. So historically, if you were to import photos into Lightroom, they get imp they get synced to the, if you would take up cloud storage space. Yeah. Um, well, local next to cloud the, and next to the cloud tab. And you can basically browse your entire computer, your internal drive, any external drive and view the contents of those folders. So if there are images in there, they show up just like you would uh, in bridge. And what's even cooler is that you can have access to the pretty much the entire Lightroom editing suite. You can uh, edit the photo with all of the different sliders and tools. You can use um, photo merge. So you can merge to HDR and Pano. You can even use the, the Denoise AI app, which I was surprised. I thought that Adobe would require you to sync those photos to the cloud. You can do, get that amazing noise reduction on, assuming that it's a supported raw file, right on, on your computer. And, and that really, what I would say that cuts the biggest argument that Lightroom Classic users have had about why they never wanted to use Lightroom. I don't want to sync my photos to the cloud. Now you don't have to. And in fact, you don't have to, and you never have to worry about a catalog infrastructure anymore. You don't have to worry about your catalog getting corrupted or anything like that. It's you just load the Lightroom 
you point it to the folder with your images and you go to town. You can export them like you would. You can send the photos to Photoshop. So it's, it's just that to me, when I saw that, I was like, oh boy, um, there's something here. There's definitely some mustard on this. It solves some problems, but when, one, of the, one of the things that I would think of is, that comes to mind is part of the promise of mobile was the the ubiquity of, or not even the ubiquity, was the ease of use of having access to all of your photos all the time, regardless mm -hmm. of the device that you're on, being able to edit on, say your phone using Lightroom or your iPad or tablet or whatever using Lightroom and then moving to the desktop or not, but having that choice to move around with each one of your devices being a window into your photo library with this local storage thing, like you, as you described it, does that all go away? Now I'm back to, oh crap, I left that folder at home. I gotta, I can't do anything to it until I get home. Are we back to that now? Or is there a happy medium in the middle somewhere? There is a happy medium. It's a yes and no. Mm -hmm. Yes, if, or rather no. If you, you have the ability now to, with local, to select an image, a collection of images or an entire folder of images, and you can have those copy to the cloud ad hoc. Again, before that was not an option. You import it into Lightroom, it gets synced to the cloud, it's in the cloud, and it becomes available on all your other devices. Yeah. Now, yes, if you're like, oh man, that fold, did I, I, I just copy this folder from my SD card and I had to run out to the grocery store or something and like, I'm in line and I'm just waiting in line. Oh, let me check. Let me start reviewing those photos. Colin, mm -hmm. I didn't because I can't because I didn't sync them. Yes, that's true. However, if you did sync them, they would be in the cloud and you have full access to them. And to me, yes, the having local is a wonderful thing, but I will yeah. still say that the primary value proposition for Lightroom is the ubiquity. That to me, I don't mean to sound like hyperbolic, but it's 100% true. Like yeah. when I, social media to me is a major, it affects me mentally in a big way. And oftentimes if I'm at the DMV or if I'm just in queue somewhere, I would, I used to just load X or load Facebook or something and just get miserable. It's just, it's the equivalent <laughs> of me just smashing my face with a bag of potato chips. I know that this is not nourishing or nutritious it's McDonald's now, like, you know what I'm exactly. hungry I'm in a hurry uh, let me go eat a Big Mac and then after it you just want to <laughs> yeah you qu you question life decisions there it's like now I would just load Lightroom it's like it's second nature for me I just go straight to Lightroom it's on the my home screen of my iPhone and I'll yeah. just find a folder and I'll either purge and I'll just go through and re do a, what's called a speed review and that's actually yeah. a whole separate thing this whole thing of like where we don't delete photos, that's a whole separate kind of philosophy that I have. Um, but it's so much to me, it's so much more mentally stimulating and satisfying. And I'll uh, sometimes more often than I'll, I'll be like, oh man, I totally forgot that I took these photos and I'll edit a few of them. And now I have something that's actually productive. So yes, Frederick. Yeah. Yes and no. It's still yes and no. Yeah. And I'm wondering when it syncs. So if I say, yeah, here's my photo library and I want this folder to sync up to the cloud because this, this is my working directory. All the yes. things that I'm currently working on are in this directory. So therefore make those available to me. I may or may not use them, but I want, I feel like whatever's in there might get used. Everything else, yeah, that can just be local and get archived and be backed up however I do it or back up everything depending on how large your, uh, your library is. But my question is, when it's syncing, what is it syncing? Is it syncing a low resolution proxy, like a JPEG or something? Is it throwing up the whole raw file, including the XMP sidecar with all the edits and up to the minute edits? What what actually gets into the cloud? And am I giving up anything if I'm sitting in that dentist office waiting my turn and I pull out my iPad and I pull up a photo that I shot, presumably the raw file, what am I, what can't I do in that situation that I can do if I was at a proper desktop environment? I mean, that's a fantastic question. The, if, right off the bat, whatever you sync is whatever, the file that you have is what syncs. There's no proxy smart preview or anything. That's what happens with Classic. If you were to sync your photos from Lightroom Classic to the cloud, it will not sync the raw, it will only sync a smart uh, lossy proxy, which is the smart preview. 
yeah. in Lightroom, in local, if you're in local and you're like, hey, these 10 photos or this folder, I want this in the cloud. And you say sync to cloud or copy to cloud. It mm -hmm. will copy the actual raw files. It doesn't need the XMP files anymore. It will take whatever edits you make, but it manages all of that in the cloud. So there's no okay. more concept of, oh, I need the XMP file as well. It's all in the cloud. Here's an important point though, Frederick, because I know you're interested in, in, in possibly adopting this workflow. Yeah. So let's say we have, you have image one on your hard drive mm -hmm. and then you copy, you, you, there's a button copy to cloud. So now you have, so let's call it image one. Yeah. Dot uh, ARW that copy gets sent to the cloud. It's there, it, there is no asynchronous connection. If you were to continue to edit that local copy image one on your hard drive, you, which you could, it's not like that those edits would update automatically to the cloud. There's another copy of that photo in the cloud. So what you can manually, let's say image one, you sit, you copy it to the cloud. Um, an hour later, you make some edits, you apply a preset to image one, that update will not be reflected in the cloud unless you press the copy to cloud again, at which case. What happens is Lightroom, Lightroom doesn't have what's called a uh, virtual copy and classic did it has mm -hmm. its closest analog is called versions. And so what it'll do is it'll create a new version in the cloud, the version of the image in the cloud with the preset that you applied. And I apologize. This is much easier to show than it is to talk about. Yeah. But yeah. Here's how I, the easy, the best way that I can approach this to you, Frederick is any local files that you decide to copy to the cloud, pretend as if you no longer have access to it local, only work on the cloud. Those images and those edits will be available on all of your devices. And it just is easier to manage that way. You will always have the local copy there just as a backup purpose. But as far as editing goes, my recommendation would, it, it, you'll run into for lack of better words, you'll run into a versioning issue. Like, oh, which. That's what I'm worried about. Yeah. That's well, what I'm worried yeah, about. Yeah. And that's why you don't, there's nothing to worry about. If once you, here's a workflow, a super quick workflow. You yeah. get home from a shoot, you copy the photos, just you mount your SD card, you select all, copy them to the, a folder on your computer, mm -hmm. you into the local, you find that folder. And the only thing that you do is you do your culling, you do your ratings and your deletes. Once you have those done and you're down to what I would consider to be your best photos, the photos you should be keeping, copy those to the cloud. Now you don't have to worry anymore. You'll have your backup, but I do agree that is a workflow conundrum. That is a, I feel like that could bite me, right? Cause I'm like, and maybe I'm missing something. Cause I'm thinking if I, if anytime humans are involved with something, <laughs> i.e. me, there's gonna be errors made, right? So if I have to be proactive in moving something somewhere in order for things to happen correctly, it's gonna break. I need it, if I have to move files to the cloud or flag them somehow that they know to go to the cloud, and then the one that's local, I should never touch again once I put it in the cloud, I'm absolutely gonna to touch that local one and I'm absolutely gonna be out of sync somewhere. That's the fear. Am I now I'm yes. out of sync and oh, I had it perfect, but they're not showing here and I'm on a road trip and I need to show this in a presentation. But the edits I made, I accidentally made them to the local copy at home and this is the cloud copy. What do I do? Is there a safeguard against that to make sure that I'm not a victim of myself? No, not that I can, because there is no option that I know of currently that will automatically um, copy an up a, an update that you made to a local file to the cloud. It's something that's, it's a manual process and it's just, I'm, I'm the workflow that I'm advocating for this whole start local, do your culling and then just copy the cloud. I'm advocating for that because I believe that, like I said before, the, the unique value proposition of Lightroom is its cloud-based ecosystem. However, yeah, I also understand that just, there are people who are just resistant to it. In which case you have to be okay with the fact that it's just pretty much just like classic in that it's a local editing suite. It's very powerful and you have the option, unlike classic, which only will sync smart previews, 
you have the option to, as long as you're diligent, to sync your full resolution file. And yeah, I mean, it will, oh, there, unless Adobe released a, a, an option that will auto detect a change to, to an image and then sync it. Cause it can, a, Lightroom knows which photos were copied to the cloud and which weren't. You can filter by that in the local. Yeah. So okay. we have to remember this is a version, this is a V1 thing, even though Lightroom desktop is V, it's still, a, a, I have no this doubt. This feature. It will get, yeah. This feature is a V1 yeah. thing. I have no yeah. doubt it will improve, but. Okay. So I here, we can talk about this forever because yeah, sure. I have so many questions, uh, but uh, here's a wrap up question. And this is a big one. So the ecosystem options that photographers, both advanced amateur or even pro right, that we have available to us is large and vast, right? So there's uh, of course, Lightroom and the cloud, the creative cloud and all that. Then we've got Google photos and we've got Apple and photos in there that we can, they want our photos. There's a number of services, smug mug, of course, right? Flickr, there's a number of places where we can upload and store and share our photos. I think one of the holy grail things for photographers is I just want a place, I just, I want my images to be safe and I want to be able to access them when I need to and I want to be able to work on them and I want the tools to be mature and robust enough to let me do what I need to get done to the images on the vice I'm using. Like does Lightroom the, the way that Adobe's positioned Lightroom, does it obviate the necessity to use all the other tools out there or does it complement them? Like, can I use Lightroom and SmugMug? Obviously I can Im export into SmugMug for storage or to share and make my galleries and all that. But what about SmugMug Source and using SmugMug Source as the repository, the, the, my data pool for my digital asset management life or one of the other services out there? Or is Adobe selling the dream of all your base are belong to us and do it all in Lightroom and you will be happy? Like what, what's the play? I mean, the play is that, and I've gotten that question a lot, like from students in my course where they're like, I've got, I'm already paying for a terabyte of iCloud storage or yeah. can I, can't I use that? Yeah. And, and the, you can flip it and say, well, can't I use I want to use Apple Photos, but I just, I want the photos I have synced in the Adobe Cloud. I want to edit my photos in Apple Photos from the ones that are synced, stored in. Of course, Apple will be like, no. Same thing with Google Photos, kind of like a, their own walled gardens. And really that's, I don't know if that, if we'll ever see, that's a, it just, I don't know if we'll ever see iMessage on Android. Like it's just, it's a value proposition to keep you in that ecosystem. And also it's just like from a, just sheerly a security perspective, like I, if I were Adobe, I wouldn't want to have to rely on the secure and you know, backup strategy of Apple, even though I'm sure it's great. Right. Oh so, yeah. Yeah. But like the other side of it is, do I, like, how should my daily life operate? Like most of the photos that I take are on this thing, right? On my iPhone, I'm holding Same. up. Yeah. So the photos that are my camera roll on the iPhone, and then, you know, what I do with my Nikon and then things that I do with the 360 camera or the drone and all that is the, is what Adobe is suggesting is that all those sources, whether it's a shot of my parking spot at the Oakland airport, so I don't remember, so that I remember it, that should be in Lightroom. Uh, shots of my kid at gymnastics should be in Lightroom. Portraits that I do for a client should be in Lightroom. Drone shots that I do either for a client or just because should be in light, should everything be in Lightroom or should I continue to use separate services like Apple Photos where necessary with my phone and my personal shots and then do pro work over on Lightroom and then, you know, what's your recommendation there? That's exactly my recommendation. And that's the, it, it requires a little bit of discipline. Like I, I know people want that kind of magic bullet, like just, and yes, yeah. you could. A Lightroom on the iPhone has an op, a, a preference option to just import auto every, auto add everything. And, but it does, it can differentiate between photos and screenshots. So you don't have to worry about screenshots. Here's how I do it. I'll go out and I've been using my iPhone exclusively for a while. It's just, it's just convenient and it's a fantastic camera. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. So what'll happen is I'll take, I'll go out and I'll take the photos using either the camera, the Apple camera app or a third party app like Reflex. Those mm -hmm. all get saved to the Apple camera roll. 
when I'm done, um, and sometimes I'll take self, you know, with me or me and my wife or stuff like that. Like when I'm done, I will uh, go into Lightroom. I'll create the album for that shoot. And then I will import from the camera roll, but I manually select the images from that shoot. And I, I do not include personal photo stuff. Those are all in Apple photos. Personal is Apple photos and professional or air quotes, serious photography goes into Lightroom. It's a somewhat of a manual process. Oh, and on top of that, when the photos are imported into Lightroom and I confirm that they have synced to the cloud, then I go back into the camera roll and I delete those photos because I see no reason. Oh, uh -huh. The D word. <laughs> the D oh yeah, we can have, a uh, Frederick, we should have an episode mm -hmm. because we need to talk, there's a problem here. We need to talk about purging photos, deleting photos. We should. And there is a whole episode there because I agree with you. Like keeping it clean and purging is, you know, it speaks to the bonsai artist in my brain, right? Like get rid of whatever you don't need. If it's, if these pixels aren't sparking joy, get rid of it. <laughs> Marie you know, Kondo it. Like, yeah. Yes. Yeah. We're Thank Marie Kondo that yeah. stuff. Yeah. 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 But then I think of it and then I think of situations when I have my iPhone and somebody said, oh yeah, you remember that time back in, in 2001 when we went to Disneyland and blah, 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 and we got that shot with Groot or whatever. And then I'm like, uh, yeah, it's in my phone. I just search for whatever, boom. And I have... So my phone becomes a running archive, a photographic archive of my life, starting from sure. when I started taking photos on the phone. And it's affected, and it's right or wrong, right? So it's affected my purchase decisions on what capacity iPhone I buy next. So uh, I have a, two, my, my current iPhone has one terabyte of storage on it, which I never thought I would have in a thing that slid into my pocket. And one terabyte, and I'm not nearly filling that up, but I feel like Part of me is like, oh, I should have got that two terabyte. I should have just, <laughs> because all the, oh, I'm going to be shooting video now and doing all these other things. I need the storage on the phone versus like you say, being smart about it and offloading the old stuff somewhere. And I think part of the main reason, and I know if I offload it in the Lightroom or wherever, ever service, mug, et cetera, if I offload it there, it's going to be safe and I will be able to access it. But I think the problem with me is I haven't settled on what the exact correct workflow is for all these different modalities of Frederick the photographer. Is there, what's the correct flow? Therefore, they stay in the camera roll right now until such time I can select all and migrate them to someplace else and then continue uploading to that place instead of letting them live on my phone forever. I don't know. Yeah. I know that's flawed logic, but it's, it's kind of my brain thinks. But you're thinking differently, right? You go out there and you do shoots or you do a shot. And then once it's moved to where it needs to be, its final resting place, you delete it. It disembarks from your phone, never to be seen again, correct? But it is on my phone. It's accessible in Lightroom on my phone. But yeah, no, right, right. I delete. There, the, You're correct. It requ there, there requires discipline. Like I, I, yeah. like, and there's that D word again. There's that D word. And it's another D word, discipline and delete. Because I'm not advocating for you to delete photos of your personal stuff. However, if you were to look at my library, especially in the 2008 to 2011, the amount, uh, that was when I was obsessed with HDR, with the amount of brackets and brackets, you don't need those. The right. other thing is the all the PSDs and TIFF files that are created when you send your photos to I challenge, like, how often, genuinely, how often have you been like, oh, man, that photo from 2013, I'm so glad I have that PSD to access that layer that I needed because it, no. I What I do is I, once I'm done, I export it as a JPEG, the, the edited version, and I delete the PST. I just, worst case, I can go back and re-edit it from the source, so. And how many anyway, times have you done that, right? Ever, never. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so much to learn. Wrapping up. I know you've built a course that takes people through your journey with Lightroom and best practices as you see them and all that as Brian Matias, the all in Lightroom photographer now. So give me a little bit of, like, I don't want to make this a, a sales thing, of course, at no. all, but I feel like there's value, not that there wouldn't be, but I feel like there's, especially for this point in time and for where a lot of photographers are in terms of getting their digital lives organized, that course is uh, in a lot of ways valuable or invaluable from a, okay, where do I start and what's the state of the union? 
what is what's in that course? What did you go through and what can someone taking that course expect to get on the other side? For sure. And I appreciate that. So, yeah, it's very simple. I have been a Lightroom user since Lightroom one came out. I switched over and that's just that. If you were to go on YouTube now or on Google and do a search for Lightroom, almost everything you find will be on Lightroom Classic. People haven't really taken, educators haven't necessarily taken to the branding of Lightroom Classic. Yet there is still a massive amount of users who are starting on Lightroom, new Lightroom. So there was this, I saw this, like it was a major gap in coverage. So I went in and I learned absolutely everything there is to know about Lightroom, using Lightroom cloud-based ecosystem. So lo local is actually pretty straightforward. It's just a file browser and you edit. But with Lightroom, I would get questions from people like, hey, I want to, I'm, I want to, I'm going to Africa and I just want to take my iPad. Can I realistically just use my iPad to back up my photos and to import them into Lightroom, even if I don't have an internet connection and what happens when I get home? And there are all these kind of, some of them are use cases, some of them are edge cases, more random. And so I created this course that it's not like how to edit landscape photos with Lightroom. That's not the course. The course is when you're done, you will know everything there is to know about how to manage, how to edit and how to share your photos using Lightroom. And so that's, it's called Lightroom everywhere. Love it. Love it. Dude, we have to continue this. You have to come back on again. Uh, we have to have further conversations, not just about this, but there's a bunch of other stuff I want to pick your brain around, like your your stance on AI, of course, that's the, the topic sure. du jour for the next couple of months, years, millennia, yep. at, at least. Um, <laughs> I, I, one of the things I want to talk about is the iPhone in general and using it and how, like in my personal life, it has, I've been using iPhone more and more for things that I didn't think I'd be using iPhone for on, <laughs> or leaving the Nikon kit behind more and picking up the iPhone 15 Pro Max more. And I wonder if, I know I'm not alone in that, no. but I wonder where that's going, where that trajectory is going, considering all the other data bits that are floating around and how the industry is morphing and changing in some ways great, in some ways terrible for photographers. Yeah, I'd love to pick your brain in a future episode about that if you're up for it. Oh, I love it. I'm very much mobile first these days, so I'm with yeah. you. Yeah, love it, love it. So if, okay, so if people want to catch up with Brian, ask you questions or berate you for, for being such a Lightroom proponent or uh, you know, otherwise shoot the breeze or get the course, et cetera. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what, where should they do? What's, the, what's your home on the internet? It's Matias.com, which is M-A-T-I-A-S-H.com. That's just my last name. And then also LightroomEverywhere.com because I have a, a newsletter as well. That's Lightroom and Mobile centric like i am a, i'm with you frederick like i i'm all in so those are where you can find me the course the newsletter all that good stuff love it brian thank you so much for coming on thanks for being so enthusiastic about this stuff because it's the for me i don't know about you i'm going to suspect that you're the same way but part of the reason why i love this stuff photography content creation the whole industry the gear the hardware the people the all the stuff is because it's in a constant state of flux and yes. Yeah, yeah it may be good, sometimes bad, or for depending on your perspective, but it's never boring. There's always no. something to be excited about. There's always something to learn. There's always a way that you can refine your craft to be to make you a better artist or creator and to make you more streamlined. And this is one of them. Reexamining and recracking open that whole argument between Lightroom and you know, even berating Adobe for naming one product, as, you know, two products, the same thing. <laughs> so, yep. All that that is just beginning in a lot of ways. Thank you for coming on. I appreciate you. Thanks for having me. This is Twitter.